Um, I'd like to introduce Christian Hilchey from the University of Texas at Austin, and he's going to be talking to us today about his project, Reality Check, or Embracing Open, the Reality Check Project. Christian, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Carl. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about my project, Reality Check. This is a project that started in 2014. Um, it uh, was sponsored by the Center for European Studies, as well as my home department, the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. And I worked intimately with Carl and Natalie uh, here uh, with the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. Um, they were a phenomenal aid in terms of the advice, as well as the tech support, um, graphical design, all sorts of issues uh, that, uh, that I needed help with. So I'm, I'm really grateful for everything that they did and continue to do. Um, Reality Check is under a CC by SA license. I chose this license uh, not only because of the um, my sort of overall agreement with the license, and I really like what it um, what it enables um, uh, in terms of uh, sharing and sort of creating, uh, you know, promoting the ethos, the open ethos that is going to mean that, you know, if I create this resource, if other people want to work on it, they're going to uh, contribute back um, to uh, to ultimately my project um, in the end. Um, it also was because I was finding that I was using a lot of share alike content from Wikimedia Commons as well as other sites. Um, I really wanted to use that, and it was really integrated very tightly into the into the project. So it was kind of a necessity to uh, cho choose that license. Um, but overall, I think it was uh, a choice that I would would uh, happily make again. Um, it ended up being quite a massive project, much bigger than I ever expected. Um, and here you can see just uh, some of the, of the figures that are associated with it. Um, so, uh, you know, we lots of uh, grammar and culture lessons, um, quizzes that are located on Canvas, um, an activity book, as well as homework exercises that are printable, um, interview videos that I'll talk about in a minute, map videos, as well as lots of use of Quizlet for the uh, platform. Now, uh, why reality check? And actually, before um, I even talk about that, I want to talk about this graphic here. Um, this is uh, uh, one of Natalie's uh, creations, and it's meant to look like a beer coaster. The Czechs are really well known for uh, their their very good beer, um, and so we wanted something that sort of uh, captured uh, that aspect of their culture. But why reality check? Um, it started off with these reality style interviews um, that were filmed in Prague, as well as in Austin. We have uh, some Czech students that come. Uh, every semester to UT. Um, and it was because I had come up with these lists of questions that uh, every student needed to answer uh, uh, for various units that I was using in a previous textbook. And so I wanted to actually take those, those questions and film native speakers answering them. And the result was, here's just one example, um, what do you do when you have a headache? And I'll just uh, start playing the video just so you can get an idea what these interview videos look like. Když mě bolí hlava, tak si většinou vezmu prášek. Nebolí mě hlava nikdy. Vůbec. Ne. Naštěstí mě hlava moc často nebo. Go ahead and pause it there. So uh, these, this is how they are arranged on our website. So we have um, them divided into novice, intermediate, and intermediate advanced. That's just a result of the fact that I had so many speakers who had um, uh, volunteered to be in the videos that, um, and I was finding actually that some were more, um, uh, you know, very simple answers, one, two words, a sentence, maybe two sentences at most. And some people were really uh, responding in paragraph like utterances. And since I had that material, it really made sense uh, to utilize them um, and make them available to the public. I will note though, for the textbook itself, I only utilize those from the novice intermediate because this course is geared for a, or towards a uh, beginning um, Czech language instruction course. So uh, the course is run, um, it's a flipped classroom. Um, there's a pre-class, uh, in-class components and post-class components. Um, and it's just this cycle that keeps repeating every day. Um, and this is what the pre-class looks like. Now, if you uh, wanna take a look at any of these materials, you can go to realitycheck.org and you will see it like this. So this is how it exists on um, the uh, publicly uh, facing uh, website. And various aspects of the course here, for example, um, if you were if you had access to the key, you would see that some of these are grammar explanations. Quizlet is obvious. There's some some various uh, uh, quizzes, usually auto grade type quizzes, um, to test uh, knowledge. 
of the um, of the topics that we're learning. Um, and pre-classing involves a lot of um, uh, just you know the, just these various uh, thematic related uh, explanations. As you can see, I like to use a lot of pictures in there. Something I'm going to talk about um, in just a minute. Um, Pre-class also includes Canvas quizzes. A lot of these are, as I said, fill in the blank or multiple choice, something that can be uh, graded and, they can, and the students can get feedback immediately. Um, and I use a lot of Quizlet in the curriculum and I try to use it to uh, its utmost. So basically anything that I could think of that uh, could work within, within Quizlet's uh, parameters um, of all the different uh, types of activities that they have, I try to utilize those in uh, thoughtful ways in the course. Um, so in their course modules, when vocabulary is introduced or even grammar topics, I use Quizlet as a way to uh, quickly reinforce those forms. In class um, is all about practicing the language in uh, various communicative scenarios, also using games, things like that. And I tried to really utilize all of the positive aspects of Google Drive. Um, so, uh, here you can see, for example, on the left, uh, this is a, a memory type game. You can download a set of cards. So this links to another Google Doc where you can, where you can uh, click on it, get um, all those cards, print them out, cut them out, and have um, them available for class. Similarly, uh, oftentimes uh, activities are uh, given not only in the activity book, but as a um, PowerPoint type presentation, or rather Google Slides, and you can click on those and get access to those as well. Now, I really like to utilize a lot of realia in, in the textbook. So here's just one example where we're talking about uh, clothing preferences and, and giving opinions on clothing. And, and this one uh, YouTube uh, user uh, decided to uh, give three examples of a work outfit that, that, that they like and ask the viewers, you know, what do you think? What do you like the best? And so this was a perfect opportunity for us to use realia um, and really also show the students how much they've learned. You know, they walk away from these types of activities. I never knew that I would have actually, you know, understood that much um, after that being or doing check for just a few months. Um, so I'm going to skip this one for here. Um, post class is given um, either at the end of a, a Canvas module or here on uh, the uh, public course site. Um, on the right-hand side. These are various uh, Google Docs. Um, and these Google Docs, again, um, they involve more of the uh, type of uh, use of language that builds from the skills that we learned in the pre-class and the in-class. So um, lots of creating with language, um, giving opinions, or coming up with their own uh, descriptions, um, things like that. Oftentimes, also, I take advantage of the fact that we do have uh, access to stores, for example. So why not send them shopping? So here's just one example uh, taken from an assignment where they have to do some shopping for groceries and plan a meal at Tesco in Prague. So getting to the title of my uh, presentation, which was uh, Embracing Open. Um, one, I, I've kind of identified three different areas where I feel that the, the, the reality check really tried to take advantage and leverage all of the open or all of the sort of the values of openness um, that we, we often talk about. And one was really reusing um, and remixing of other content that's currently available. In other words, not reinventing the wheel. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we know about this in terms of talking about the five R's. Um, and um, so, you know, there's so much material that's out there. Why not take advantage of this? And so this involved lots of different uh, repositories of open images. Literally thousands and thousands of images have been used uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the curriculum. Um, and just as you saw from a few examples, uh, images are a, a constant presence um, in the course. Um, everything from clip art to, to actual uh, photos from places like Wikimedia Commons or all of the different um, uh, public domain uh, websites as well. And I use them, I try to use them in creative ways. So it might be creating meme-like content and, and using that to teach words and phrases or just to, um, you know, sometimes when you're, when you're doing something really tough, it's, kind of, it's fun for the students to, to run across some sort of, uh, uh, funny content, um, or even if we're trying to learn uh, various uh, words and phrases or grammar. So in Czech, 
if you want to say I like to sleep, you literally say I happy sleep, kind of you know uh, playing off that lol cats uh, kind of genre. Um, or if you want to say my head hurts, literally head hurts me. Or this is one of my favorite ones that I bring up a lot. Um, use it, trying to learn irregular verb forms. Just trying to use them in fun, creative ways that help students help the, these these uh, students to uh, retain um, or understand better some of the, the the concepts that we're learning. Now uh, I mentioned uh, pictures, but let me talk about video as well. Um, one of the things that I found really uh, helpful in terms of the creation of these materials was uh, the amazing world of blogs. There are uh, people who uh, create content, po po post it under an open license on YouTube, on Vimeo, and they have pretty rich channels. In fact, when you find one of these users, you can then click on their channel, and of course, you find that they always publish their content or often publish their content um, under a Creative Commons license. And so really it was about you know, making that discovery. And this is one of the sort of critical moments for Reality Check was making this discovery that all this great content out there exists. Um, it's under an open license. I can use it, edit it, um, create sort of custom versions of it for my class. And so that's something that I try to utilize um, in all of the chapters. Um, and it can be as simple as something like a drone video that I use in the first unit. So just something where we, you know, get a chance to see Prague. And while we're at it, let's talk about the things we see. And of course, we see lots of them. So that's a natural place for us to practice the plural, et cetera. So really trying to, to use open media uh, to its full extent, really sort of realizing all of the affordances of open, that there's this stuff out there for us. So let's see if we can integrate it. Let's really sort of, um, you know, buy into the whole uh, open project. Um, and I actually identified a number of international keywords, sort of these video genres that you can use. And I think these are really helpful. Um, you know, typing in vlog, just as a, an English word, and then typing in all sorts of words in the target language can get tons of great content. And not only the videos related to that search, but also finding those channels of users who are posting lots of open content. I've given you some other ones here, such as time lapse, haul, unboxing, and room tour. And these are, as I said, really fruitful genres um, for those considering trying to integrate openly licensed video into the curriculum. Use of platforms, which allow for ECF export of materials. And, and really, this comes down to using Google and Quizlet. These are um, also tools that I think are helpful because we all or most of us have used these, we feel comfortable with them. Um, and so if I want to, for example, make sure that my users can, for example, um, redistribute, revise, remix, they can do these to my, uh, to my materials because that's my goal really. I want my, my, the, the people who use my forms to come up with their own custom versions, to show me something that I didn't know um, or for this project to have continuity beyond me when I will no longer have interest in the project that this can keep going. Um, I wanna make sure that the materials are in a format that make it, makes it easy for them to be edited. And so if you go to any of the content sites on, uh, on uh, realitycheck.org, you'll see that you can open it up in three different formats, uh, Google, uh, PDF, and Word. And so this really helps uh, uh, maintain the spirit of those five Rs. Um, additionally, I have provided Canvas export. So if any instructor out there wants to adopt the whole course, including all the Canvas content, um, this Canvas content is available. All the quizzes, for example, are available to the public over the publicly facing website. But if you want quizzes that are going to be tracked for your students, or rather to be able to track your students with those quizzes, then use one of my Canvas exports and really sort of buy into the whole curriculum. And of course, that gives you the option to make any modifications that you wish to. Um, same with uh, with Quizlet. You know, finding these, even though these are these are resources that allow you, you know, to publish um, under any license, including traditional copyright, allowing you to export them easily. Here, for example, in the, in the form of a CSV file is really important. I think to making sure that our that our materials don't get stuck in a single um, sort of piece of technology. Finally, my pedagogical approach, and and on a certain sense, this is actually very personal for me because. Um, as I began the project, um, I had all sorts of ideas, but I, through the process of learning about all of the other open resources, as well as some of the materials I myself was creating, I really learned that I had to think more openly about uh, how, what kind of materials are good and how I can use them. And so I learned actually in the process 
that these reality style videos that I had created were really also showing us an example of non-normative language. They were using forms that weren't traditionally taught in textbooks. And then I realized that some of these ways that they're responding are actually the keys to uh, how my students are re responding. So I went back and uh, I, I realized uh, that what we need to do is, is embrace that. What do I really need to do to teach my students to use these forms or rather to, uh, to answer these questions? And what I actually go off and say to my students now is, you know, this course really is about answering about 100 questions in check. And that's kind of an oversimplification of it, but it, not by too much. Um, the process of learning how to answer these questions about themselves, people around them, um, really leads to them learning everything that they need to do to be proficient in um, in check. And so really I choose a lot of the grammar and the vocabulary based off of what they need to answer those questions. And so this really this sort of kind of example of, of reverse design. Um, how do we get to where we want to go? Well, we design backwards for that. Um, and it was also realizing that I needed to include things like non-standard check, which is so common in everyday utterances and the 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 interviews that I uh, that I uh, filmed and created, as well as the content that I was finding on YouTube, all were examples of this common check of this sort of lower variety, but this is important and is often left out of textbooks, but I, I felt that it was really important for my own pedagogy to question these, you know, do we, what are the, is the ideological basis for leaving these out uh, one that I really agree with, and, and in the end it's not. Um, and reality really was finding all of this great content that was that is out there and, and adapting my pedagogy to uh, help my students interact better with with those uh, with with those things that I was finding. And so, you know, when I started off, I started off with this scope and sequence, and and you can see right there in the left, the grammar was the most important thing for me. And really, I abandoned this um, as I began creating this this curriculum to one that was more, much, much more communicatively driven. And, and as I've been describing, really sort of focusing on what do the students need to achieve the, or to accomplish these tasks. And so I like to uh, just describe this or, or, or use the analogy of a farmer's market. I, instead of going to this sort of, um, you know, I have this elaborate plan that I, for what I wanna to cook tonight, and then realizing maybe there's no tomatoes or you know, there's some other vegetable I had planned on uh, cooking with is no longer available. Well, there's still a lot of great stuff out there. And so you know, whether it's the open content that uh, I was finding or the, um, or the materials that I was finding through my interviews, it was really about embracing that, that and being open to that. Uh, you know, what is out there and how can I use it to really help um, meet my proficiency goals? In the end, uh, I can say that it's, it has been a really positive experience because I've noticed uh, massive changes in how my students end up their course with, uh, in terms of their proficiency gains. Um, so it's overall been, a, been, a, been an extraordinary experience. So um, again, if you uh, want to visit uh, the website, it's realitycheck.org. I hope you'll, you'll take a look at it. I almost said check it out. Um, and then at this point, if you have any questions, um, have to answer them. I might have gone a little bit over time, and my deepest apologies for that. I'm going to ask you a question while people are <clears throat> cogitating. Then, so your your idea here is embracing open, and maybe you didn't really embrace open completely at first. What do you think was your biggest challenge to overcome? Uh, why did you not like embrace openness originally? I mean, I think there were a number of reasons. Part of it was um, I was hearing that there were these great materials available, but I didn't really know how to search for them. And so there was this one night just searching in YouTube. And, and I remember it was, I mean, it was like the parting of the Red Sea. It was like, I didn't know about anything. And then suddenly I'm able to, I, I know, you know, I, I'm finding all this amazing stuff. And it was just a, a really sort of, um, really key moment for me because I, I came up with, you know, maybe 20 bookmarks in the span of like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I and I realized though, I mean, I, I, I looked at it and I thought there's all this great material out there, but then how do I use it? And so I had to really be creative and sort of thoughtful about how could I actually use this 
this material, it's really great, but it doesn't sort of fit into the pedagogical framework that I've been using, the paradigm I've been using. So let's maybe change that paradigm. Change the paradigm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Christian. Um,